Good morning, everybody. How are you? So nice to see everybody this morning. Um, before we kick off, do you know what? I'm going to ask a different question this morning because today we're talking all about intellectual property and trademarking. And I would love for all of you this morning to write in the box. So I want you to say where you're coming from, but also tell us a bit about what kind of business you have. Um, because it would be really interesting since we're talking about trademarks and IP, we would love to see what kind of businesses and what sort of industries are taking part in today's workshop. So just before, as we let everybody in, I would love for you just to tell us a little bit about what you're doing. So Narmeen is uh, an art and events agency, executive and team coaching, See, what other industries are you all from this morning? E-commerce, interior and landscape architect. Fantastic. So let us know. Do let us know what kind of business and industry you have. It would be great if we can talk about some of your industries when we're running today's workshop. Personal care and e-commerce, plant-based cheese. Oh, Alice, you're after my own heart. I only eat plants. I love the sound of that. Yoga studio, beauty, cosmetics, finance, coaching, and corporate gifts. Um, we've got raw honey retail and corporate gifts, engineering. Uh, someone says trademark Dubai. So maybe we've got someone else who's working in trademarking, maternity e-commerce. Got a bit of everything that you're all doing this morning in the process of registering an e-commerce or an education consultancy. Great. So keep it coming. Tell us about what uh, what areas you're working in, just so we can keep that in mind for today's session. We still have lots of people joining us. I'm just going to give it another minute. Perfume, desserts, cafe. Mm, Fatma, that sounds good. So for those of you who have just joined us, just give us a shout and tell us what kind of business you have, just because it will be really interesting for today's session since we're covering intellectual property and trademarking, just to understand what businesses you're coming from and what activities you're doing. Uh, Patricia's doing service, website and app. Great. Lots and lots of different diverse range. And this is what I love about all of these sessions is we have such a range of women from just starting out to very large organizations as well. Um, Sahara's got a publishing house, fantastic. Okay, what I'm gonna do, we're aiming to finish at 12 o'clock today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick off with some of our housekeeping stuff because I have some really great announcements just to share with you. And then as more people join, we'll kick off for today's session as well. So I am just gonna bring up our PowerPoint presentation that's got a little bit of information with some announcements I want to share with you. So for um, today, you're going to be, we're going to be covering intellectual property and trademarking with Munir. And I'm going to get Munir to introduce himself in a second. I'll be hosting today's session as usual. As we do have, we still have quite a large group for today's session. So if you do have questions, pop them into the chat box. What I'm going to be doing is watching the chat box, following up with Munir, throwing out questions to him that are going to be relevant for the different sections that we're covering. And then if there's any other uh, questions, we can always pick that up towards the end of the session today as well. I just want to ask all of you too, if you're not already following UN Women and NAMA Women on Instagram and LinkedIn, please do. Also as well, a lot of, if you're not following NAMA Women on Instagram, especially, you should definitely be following them because that is also where all of the announcements for the UN Women sessions are appearing. So if you follow them on there, you'll be able to get the latest information about when things are happening. So a couple of things, you probably received an email this week. And if you didn't, I'm going to tell you about it here and share with you the link. UN Women and NAMA Women Advancement Establishment are putting together a 
women's own business directory. And so this is really great that they're going to be sharing this with businesses and government entities who want to be able to purchase products and services from women owned businesses. So my colleague Hib is going to post the, the link for how you can register. There's a type form that you can fill in and all you need to do if you are a women majority women owned business. So what that means is that you're 51% female owned and controlled. So that could be one female or many females, so long as you're 51% female owned and controlled. Now, I've also been asked because there are people who are expats and they have the, the deal where it's 49 and 51. And so the same thing goes again with your 49% share, so long as 25% of your business with your local partner is women owned, you also qualify for that as well. And it's also for women who are freelancers, if you have a company in a free zone, all of those things count. So if that is relevant for you, Hibba will place the information in the chat box. So you can go and click on that link or you can go back to the email that we sent you as well. There's also going to be an email coming next week when we did our initial survey of women business owners, we had a number of women say that they wanted to have a mentor. So we have now identified the people who are going to be involved in the mentoring program. And starting next week, we will be opening it up for applications for people who are looking for a mentor. So if you would like to have a mentor in your business, if this is something for you, do make sure that you apply next week. You don't need to worry. The email hasn't gone out, but do be looking for this email next week because there's an opportunity for you to get involved in this program. And our mentors are fantastic mm -hmm. as well. Can I also ask everyone, please, to turn off your microphones just so we don't have any feedback? Um, but next week we'll have that. And then also just a few announcements from some of our partners. So Dubai, Women, Dubai Business Women Council are closing off their applications for their She Leads 2.0 for the accelerator and incubator that they're running. So do go onto their website because they have extended the deadline and it finishes off in the next couple of weeks. So please do go on to Dubai Business Women Council to register for that. And there's also a really cool um, thing that's coming up, Access Sharjah Challenge. So you can go onto the Shara website and what this is, Rambi, can you turn off your microphone, please? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so the Access Charge Challenge, there's two competitions and it's aimed for people who have businesses in the arts field. So there's information on that. So if you're an artist, they have some really exciting competitions for you. So please do go look on the Shara website and there's more information on how you can apply for that as well. Okay. We're going to kick off our whole discussion about trademarking and intellectual property. But before we do, what we'd love to do over here is we want to have a view about how much you know about trademarks and intellectual property, but in the UAE as well. So there's going to be a poll, which is just gonna pop up on the screen here. Hiba, do we have the poll? I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Yes, yes. Great. So here's the poll. If everybody could please fill this in and let us know how much you know about trademarks and intellectual property in the UAE, because this will also help Munir as well to be able to, to pitch it at the right level and to give you the right amount of information for today's session. And actually, while this is running, Munir, you can actually pop up your presentation. I've unshared my screen. So you can pop up your presentation so we can get ready to go. And while you're filling that in as well, I'm, I'm so delighted that we have Munir here to, to share his knowledge and his experience with us. Because 
intellectual property and trademarking is such an important area for us as business owners and entrepreneurs. And oftentimes this gets overlooked. And so this is why we wanted at the very beginning of the UN Women NAMA program to bring a trademark specialist in to, to the group to be able to talk to you about the benefits of intellectual property and trademarking and what you need to do. So while you're finishing off the poll, Munir, why don't you just introduce yourself and then we'll go look at the poll quickly and kick things off with you. Sure, sure Jan, thank you very much for this beautiful introduction. Very good morning to everyone. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be here with you this morning. My name is Munir Sabo. I am an intellectual property lawyer, has been in practice in the Middle East and the GCC for the last 16 years. Uh, originally, I'm from Jordan by way of background. My specialty and my master's degree in intellectual property and information technology laws um, was obtained from the Bay Area in San Francisco back in 2006. And after that, I moved here to start my practice and journey in IP and trademarks. It really gave me a great pleasure to be here with you this morning. Um, I cannot uh, add to any of the housekeeping that Jenny has just briefed you all on it, but feel free to write your question or any inquiry or anything that come up in your mind uh, in relation to our slides or something that you have it before in either languages, whether in Arabic or in English, please feel free to put it there and we will try to get that and address it. I'm leaving a few uh, minutes at the end of the session today to deal with the Q and A's. But if there is any question that will be relevant to what we are saying, maybe Jenny can raise it and we can speak about it. We want this to be very engaging. I know and I appreciate that we have more than 50% uh, of the audience, either they have an average or poor or no knowledge about the IP. So I do appreciate the fact that you sign up and you wanna come here and, and get to know more about this important topic. And to be honest with you, I get a lot of speaking opportunities, speaking to a lot of different business owners, entrepreneurs, small businesses. And this has been the situation for, for the last few years. But among all the opportunities that I have, this particular one that came from United Nations Women, I feel so proud that I got it. I feel so proud that I'm with you today, not only because I uh, have the chance to speak with this huge audience and turnout, but because of the cause that this UN is doing and support all small businesses. I'm privileged with that. I came from a family where my mom has been working for four years, raising up, supporting her kids, having two or three jobs, in addition to her core and the most difficult job, which none of us can do except the great women and mothers can do for her kids. Uh, I appreciate the fact that you spend time to think of your independencies, growing your businesses. And this is something I feel very much engaged and I would love to stay in touch with each one of you in this session and after this session to see how I can support you. If you are small businesses, I'm happy to engage with you on a pro bono basis when you need a support. If you need any quick support on how to protect your IP or trademark rights, I'm happy to have a chat with you and give you the support you need. Women, build the great economies. All the industrial countries, all the big economies in the world, it's based on women. I believe in that. I have been working with a bunch of great talented ladies. All my team members are women, 100% except me are women. So I know when the capabilities and when you wanna empower and enable any successful business model, you will need to rely on a talented hard worker and great woman who give all the dedication and motivation for the business that they run. So uh, I will try, as I said, to keep this as much as engaging as possible. And uh, before I jump into my slides, and since we have a few people have no idea what is the IP and what is the intellectual properties. And before I jump to a classification of IP and giving you an overview about it, I just need you to think about what is the background of IP? What is the rationales of the IP? Why we have intellectual property protection legislated and protected globally in all over the world. It has some philosophical background. It has some theories to support this hundreds of years ago. And I can think of two important theories that you probably need to be aware of and you would agree with it. 
And once you agree with these theories, you will understand what is the IP and why we should get a protection and ownership for intellectual property rights. The first theory, it's called the John Locke theory. I'm sure most of you read about the philosophy and they know that the labor theory is one of the most prominent theories in the, in the, in the history. When someone work on something, when someone spend time and efforts to deliver something, he should be eligible and entitled to claim ownership on this type of works. This is a natural right. All philosophies, all religions, all neutral laws, natural laws support this idea. So this is the bottom roots of the most well-known theories to support the protection of IP. And later when civil systems start to be there and the countries start to establish their constitutions, they start to accept that IP protection will make an economic incentive for the person who own IP rights. So when you give the protection for the people who make innovation, who make IP rights, who create IP rights, you give them the right to exclusively enjoy and exploit those assets, you will support your economy. You will basically build assets and you will let these people invent and do more and more and more. So if someone writes a book and they spend days and hours and nights to do a great book, the minimum protection you should give is to give that person the exclusivity to copy and to get the economic return of all these type of exploitations. So these two theories, they are the most well known in the history of the IP that support the protection. The protection went through a lot of different phases, but I would say in the last century, there has been a huge boost where we got most of the countries in the world, including the UAE, where they establish a very strong pieces of legislations that can assure businesses, individuals' rights on intellectual property are protected. The classification of the intellectual properties is something that you probably need to be aware of. And you need to start by knowing that what type of IP rights are there. You probably heard about these terminologies from the media, from the social media, from your normal reading, from licensing, when you go for a licensing of your businesses. And when you do this, you probably get puzzled. What does that mean? I'm sure you all know about your domain names. You know about when you register a domain name, you own it. So that's pretty much it. So this is probably everyone knows it. But when it comes to a patent or a trademark or copyright or trade secrets or know-how, I think a lot of confusion is going to be there. So it's very important for you to become aware of this five major element of IP rights. There are some other type of IP rights, which are the intangible assets. Intangible assets, that means something you don't touch it. When you own a car, when you own a property, when you own a, a movable assets, this is something you can see it in your visually, you can hold it, you can register it, and you can get a custody and control over it. But when things that are intangible, something that you cannot touch it, but it exists there and the value is there, then we are talking about the intellectual property rights. And you can think of anything that you created that you don't touch it or you cannot have it in your hands or you cannot really move it. This can belong to one of these IP rights. I will start with a quick definition about the trade secrets, copyrights, trademarks, and all of these rights. And then we'll try with our time today to take you through the most common IP rights that you probably need to be aware of. And we'll give you some life examples. And then we'll end up our discussion with how you can protect it and enforce it. Trade secrets is the very classified and confidential information. This is something that is not disclosed. It is a, whether a formula, business method, anything that you come up with that can help you to do an added value for your businesses or for other humanity or for a product. And that particular asset or that particular formula is something no one can get access to. The very well-known example for that that we are aware of is the formula of the Coca-Cola that has been there for 100 years. And it's worth billions now. Nobody knows it, only a few people who have a very strict confidentiality uh, commitment to keep those secrets. If you come up across with an invention or something that you feel that no one can reach it, 
no ordinary person in your industry can reach to the formula. And if you feel that you can do it and put it in a product and put the product in the market and not having anyone to do a reverse engineering or to analyze that product and get to the formula, then it's worth for you to protect it as a trade secret. And it's very simple protection. You just need to make sure that you kept it in a confidential, confidential phase. Any person who comes and access it, any entity, they just need, you need to be very careful with whom you share this secret and you have all the confidentiality documents and commitments in hand. The minute that the trade secret become known to public or anyone can get it through their own reverse engineering process or by a negligence by the holder of trade secret, the protection will demolish and it will become a public domain. No one can stop anyone from using it. A lot of big corporate do have the trade secrets and they keep trade secrets. Copyrights. Copyrights, I'm sure all of us have heard it, whether in context of piracy that a lot of IP and copyright owners suffer from. It's basically the literary work, the work of author. And you can't think of anything that you can offer and you can fix it in a tangible assets like or a medium level of expression, this can become a copyrightable work. Whether you write a poetry or you do a film movie or you write a small essay or you become a cross with any architect works, designs. I know that there's a lot of uh, architects here in this room. So if you become with any particular drawing that you feel that this has been new, original, no one has done it before, just fix it, put it in a paper, have a documentation to show that you created on that date, you will get a protection. Copyright does not require registration to get a protection. You can simply claim protection from the date when you create the work. So long as you have created that work and it's an original work. Minimum originality is fine. So you don't need to create something that is extremely extensive. So if you really have the talent to come up with a manual for a restaurant that you come up with, or you created a menu that has a, a new name and synonymous names, this by itself can be eligible for a copyright protection if you show that you created those rights and, and, and you got it on that day. Registration is possible for those rights. You can approach the Copyright Office, which is in the Ministry of Economy. The process is very simple and very easy, and it's very cost effective. Maybe it's going to cost you less than 100 dirhams to register a copyright title. So recordal is recommended, and you're going to get a certificate for that, but it's not required. What happens in copyrights is that you get an exclusive rights. You can prohibit any third party from copying those rights without giving you the financial rewards of it. So you can stop anyone from piracy of this type of uh, rights. You can uh, take any action to block any third party from, from doing it. And normally the copyright, you see it a lot on your media. You see the symbol of the C in a circle. That's mean the owner or the author of those type of content is claiming ownership and is claiming that those are copyrightable materials. So make sure before you copy it, you need to get the authorization of the copyright owner. Third, trademark. Trademark is the most common and most phenomena IP rights that is well known globally and in our region. It's basically the uh, the slogan, the term, the word, uh, any symbol or any slogan that you can use to distinguish the source of your services and goods. It's a pretty much used in a trade. So that's why you have histories of people who use trademarks that goes for 300 or 400 years ago, or probably more. Any source identifier of services and goods can uh, uh, support uh, the owner of the trademark to hold rights and to uh, claim ownership on their brands. You are all user of those brands. You are all customers of those brands at trademarks. You can also, as a business owner, be the owner of these trademarks that can add to the value of your, of your rights. Uh, 
there is no uh, uh, formalities on, on, or no restriction on what you can use as a trademark, so long as it's not against the public order and so long as it does not conflict with the pre-existing rights. So if you come up with a new product and you want to merchandise this product, you can name it and you can give it a trademark and you can register this trademark. Registration of trademark is important in the UAE. If you don't have a registration for your trademark, you're pretty much going to lose the ownership. In some other countries, they allow, based on use, to claim some ownership and some enforcement. But in the UAE and many other countries, you have to have the mark registered to be able to claim ownership and to be able to enforce it. Domain names, I've explained it to you, we all know it is the URLs, first come, first serve. If you have that domain name, you have ownership. A lot of business models, e-commerce, they are all built on domain names and the domain name get the value at some stage. Make sure that your domain name, when you select it, does not, even if you have it approved by your registrar, does not conflict with a pre-existing trademark. If there is a pre-existing trademark, in the UAE or anywhere else, they can come and file a cyber squatting action against a domain name and they can take over the domain name ownership. So for the people who are in the e-commerce, make sure that your domain name is properly cleared and make sure that it does not conflict with any other trademarks and make sure that you move and register it as a trademark to ensure that you have the proper protection. Finally, last but not least for today is the patent and industrial design. I'm sure you heard about the term patent. Patent is the innovation. It's basically the trade secret, but the owner of that trade secret decide to disclose his invention and he moves and register it and he get an exclusivity where he can exclude third party for a period of 20 years from using that invention. We see a lot of pharmaceuticals companies, industrial companies, high tech, they all move and register patent. Why? Because once they come up with their invention, they will know that if they put that invention in the market, their peers from the same industry will be able to reverse it and get the same product. So their trade secrets will unlikely gonna stand. Industrial design is pretty much, is the process of the designs applied to a physical product that are to be manufactured in a mass production. So before you do the mass production, you normally do an industrial design for a product, which is the shaping of the product and something that has to do with the feature of the product. If you come up with something novel, you are eligible for an industrial design protection. So all of the above rights, they give an exclusive rights for their owners to use them up and to get full exploitation of such rights and prohibit third party from using it. Each rights have a different period of time of protection, but normally those are territorial and those are a, a type of rights that are uh, uh, protected for a certain period of time. We'll start with the copyright, and the copyright is something that you probably uh, uh, is aware of it as of I discuss it. It's a work that is uh, used to protect the content, the literary work. It gives the original author the right to exclusivity on their rights, and the period of the protection is 50 years, the lifetime of the author, and then 50 years after their death. So all their inheritors can enjoy the protection of the copyrights. When the copyright owner is a corporate, it varies. The protection could be 50 years. In some other countries, it can jump to 100 years. As I said, there is no registration required, but it's always recommended and it's always advised for an owner of copyright to move and to register their copyrights. I'm going to give you a quick story about the J.K. Rowling. We all know about the successful story. She is the author of Harry Potter. The Harry Potter was a book that she read in a cafe at one stage. And then she decided 
that she wants to publish this book. And she found a proper publisher who adopted her rights and agreed with her on a publishing agreement to publish it. And it boomed and it gets some good audiences and an excellent purchase from the consumers, which encouraged her to get a second book and a third book, and a fourth book, and she did all the series that we are all aware of it. Why did I pick this example to be more specific to speak to you about the copyright? Because this is a traditional example how an author can become from an ordinary person to someone who is extremely well-known and extremely rich from using their intellectual property rights. So what did she start to do is she started, after she owned the title of the book and the title of the story, she started to give license for other third party to either publish it or reprint it and to generate financial revenues and royalties from using the book. What, uh, what the publisher did is he made, they made sure that the book is getting all over the world. It gets published widely for all the audiences and they control the, the revenues that an ordinary or an individual cannot probably generate or cannot probably control. So the corporate, when they got into that level, they were able to support the, uh, the success of that story. Then later on, that work started to have something we call a derivative works. The derivative works is something that the copyright owners can always enjoy and they can always have the rights on it. So although she built a story or a book, she got some interested people in the media sector to make a film out of it and to do some translations out of it or to do even a theme parks or to do some merchandises that all inspired from the original task and from the original work. The copyright owner is eligible to protect and to give the right for third party to create a derivative works. And those creator of those derivative works, they will have their own rights on the works that they've done without undermining or without letting the owner of the original products to lose their rights. So the filmmakers, they came and they got into an agreement with the person who owned the copyright, who is the, my example, J.K. Rowling. They get the approval to move and do the licensing and they start to create their films. They got their own rights on the films and they can exploit those derivative works. But at the same time, they get the owner or the copyright owner, their share of the, of the, of the profit. So, and this is all something that an ordinary person or ordinary business owner or an individual can create if they have the talent to uh, create such a thing. And this is something that will keep rolling and will bring the revenues and a great business model for the copyright owner and all the involved parties from the publisher, or from the people who ask for the derivative works or the businesses that get the derivative works to uh, exploit it commercially. And this is just some of the example of the license and derivative works that has been created. And all of these, when they get exploited, they get a share to be paid for the original owner of the copyright of the Harry Potter. Trademarks, I will move for the most common rights that everyone, every business owner, as a small business, you probably need to be aware of. What is the trademarks? The trademarks are basically, as we said, any word, any symbol, any uh, element that you can use to distinguish either your product or services. This can be a slogan, this can be a logo, this can be a combination of both, can be a combination of colors. Anything that you can use or you feel that you can create that will help you to promote your products or promote your services. This type of rights require registration, as we said. So you apply for a trademark registration at the Ministry of Economy. This is a 10 years protection. You get it once the mark is accepted. The mark 
go through prosecution or what we call a registration process, which has three phases. After the filing and examination, you get a decision by the examiner whether to be accepted or to be rejected. It will be rejected if the mark itself conflict with the pre-existing rights. So if you move and want to file Nike for shoes of products, you will definitely gonna get the rejection. But if you come up with a new name, something that is phenomenal and has not been there before, you will likely gonna get it accepted. Once it's accepted, you will have to publish it. Publish it in official gazette or local newspaper. Both of them has to be published and that gives the third parties the right to come and oppose if they think that this mark conflict with their prior rights. If this opposition period passes, then you get a registration. That registration will be valid for 10 years. And after 10 years, you can always renew it. If you don't renew it, you will lose the protection. So the trademarks, in theory, it's a protection of 10 years, but it's renewable. So it can be to an indefinite period of time as a protection and will never fall in public domain so long as you use it and register it. The registration, that's a lot of question we get it from a lot of small businesses is, is, and a lot of business owners. Would be there a place where we can register a trademark and we get a global protection? The answer is no. Registration should be done on country by country basis. So what you register in the UAE gives you the rights to protect and use the mark in the UAE. If you wanna go for other countries, you need to go for those countries and register your marks. In some part of the region, like the European Union, you can have a regional registry that can cover 25 countries. Or in Africa, there is an OAPI registry. There was a thought and discussions to have a GCC registry for trademarks and there is a GCC treaty many, many years ago, like probably 10 years ago, but still there is no regional registry for the trademarks yet applicable in the UAE. There is also something called international registry, where you move and register your trademark at WIPO, which is the World Intellectual Property Organization under the Madrid system. And that place take the registration and it goes and do the designation for each country. It's more of administration of your trademark that allows to go for the members that are proved to be part of WIPO. UAE has just signed up this year to become part of Madrid and become part of WIPO, but still the system is not applicable. So if you need a protection, you need to go for the Ministry of Economy directly and get that protection done. The marks, once it's registered, it entitled their owners to move and to stop and for, for prohibit third party or any party from infringing these trademarks. Counterfeit goods. We have a lot of consumers complained about the counterfeit goods. Counterfeit is really bad. It's always run by a criminal people, criminal traders who violates the law, who violates the IP and trademark rights owner. They try to free ride and to take a free benefit from all the reputation and the marketing that the original brand owner done on the mark. They also move and they deceive the consumers by probably letting them believe that the product is original, maintain certain quality, but in reality, the product is not. So when you have that trademark registered, you can go and stop that counterfeiting and you can take all the action to prohibit or to confiscate these goods and get it destructive. We'll be talking more about the enforcement later, but counterfeit is one of the key terminologies that I encourage each one of you after this session to read about and to read about the dangers. Unfortunately, from many cultures, we see it in the developing countries that they deal with the counterfeit as a normal thing and as if, as if it's something that we as a consumer, we can live with it. It's fine if I can walk to one of these cheap places and buy a duplicate product, but in reality, you are supporting a business that is not as dangerous as, that is not less dangerous than the drug dealers or the human traffickers, or even the people who are, support some terrorist activities globally. 
The owner of trademarks can always stop domain names, as I said. So if you get a trademark and you get a very successful business and you end up with seeing some people taking some advantages of the domain name and general top level domain names, and they move and register domain names under different because it's available and they come and, and get you this beautiful email telling you just give me $100 or $1,000 to give back your domain name. You don't need to respond to these scammers. Your trademark rights give you the rights to claim those rights legitimately and to get those domain names that registered after the trademark is being used and registered to be canceled and to be transferred to the legitimate owner of trademark. The minute you communicate with those scammers and approve to pay or compromise with them, it's just going to be an endless. You're going to be receiving that from different sources, from different general top level domain names, and you're just going to find yourself, your mark is being hijacked, and it's going to be more expensive. Even social media pages, you see a lot of fake pages that they try to allege that this is something uh, authorized by the brand owner or by the company owners. It's all most of the reputable social media, they have a takedown policies where the trademark owner can always go and stop and take down those pages and shut them down. A lot of counterfeiters or infringers, they develop pages that have hundreds or thousands, hundreds of thousands of followers. Those got shut down over one night because they infringe the pre-existing trademarks. So think about it from your side, even if you have a small business or a startup and you want to do your own social media page and invest on it and get your own followers, make sure you do the clearance properly. Make sure that you got your name at the page properly uh, selected as this is something that you don't need to mess with. Even if you have a good faith, you did not have an intention to infringe someone else's trademarks, or you get the name out of your own thoughts or out of your discussion with your PR consultant, just make sure that you do the clearances because a lot of social media pages owners regretted that they did not do this exercise after they built a very successful business for many years, simply because when the page become huge in terms of followers and businesses, the legitimate brand owners become aware of it. And if there is a conflict, they will likely going to approach the platform and shut down those pages. I have a poll now. I would love to take your thoughts. If you want to pick a trademark, if you really want to pick a trademark and a strong trademark, what are the elements you would like to pick on? So if you are a business owner or if you're an individual and you ended up with Picking up a mark, how do you want it to be? What is the most important element? Munir, while we're waiting for people to answer the poll, do you want to take a few questions? Since Please. we're on trademark, um, we have quite a few questions on copyrights. So I think we're going to save that for a little bit, but I'll jump in on trademark. So sure. one one person has said, can we tra trademark an idea or concept? Let me just look at, so, sorry, can you read the question again? Jen, so they please? said, can, can we trademark an idea or concept? Probably not, most likely not, because if you have a concept, we need to know what is that concept? Is it the drawings? Or is it a new idea or a solution or a novel solution to resolve a problems that exist? If that is the situation, then we will have to categorize it under the patent or trade secrets. Normally the concept that you have it in a trade, you should get it and get all the artworks registered as a copyright or so as a copyright. Having said that, when you have, we have something, we call it trade dress. A trade dress of something that is the entire concept of a place that can let the consumers believe or associate that concept with a source of services or a sort of businesses. If that concept, if that concept can be put in, in one page without explaining what is that concept, then probably you will be able to protect it as a trademark. But probably trademark will not be the most suitable way to protect a concept in the UAE. 
Okay. And, and, yeah. So one other question and then we'll look at the polls. So another sure. lady asked, what if my trademark registration is done for the UAE, but someone, someone internationally wants to claim that we have the same trademark? Is it my mistake that I registered the trademark in the UAE? Well, that represents at least 40% of ownership trademark disputes that is being heard before the court. If that trademark, as I said, it's territorial. So if you go first come first serve, if you have the mark registered in the UAE and that registration is done properly, the owner or the alleged owner of international trademark or something that has been in a foreign jurisdiction should have the right to come and challenge that registration within a period of five years as a general rule by way of okay. cancellation action. But they will have to show that this registration was done illegitimate or in bad faith. The marks are identical. They have their mark. You as an applicant become aware of that mark before and you registered it in bad faith. So it's a very complicated case. Having okay. said that, the cause of action is there. The cause of action is there that the owner of internationally known trademark, if the mark is a well-known trademark and it's becoming internationally well-known, they have a cause of action on come and challenge it. Now you as a business owner, and that's why you need to do the clearance properly. And you need to make sure that it does not conflict directly or identical to other owner of trademark. If you move and use it and register it and you exceed the five years period without any issue, the chances of having your mark revoked or canceled is probably less than 5%. It's probably less than 5%. So it's a case by case basis. The cause of action is there, but if you picked a mark, you would not expect it to clear it all over the world. You are expecting to take the, the, the steps that's available in the jurisdiction where you have registration, and then you can move and use it. And the more time passes, the more protection you have, and the more it's going to be unlikely that someone is going to be successful to challenge your trademark ownership. So it's not your mistake that you moved and followed the book. The only mistake you would have done is that if you picked a mark without doing the clearances and or trying to register a mark with knowing that someone else owned this trademark in other countries. These are the only two things that you should avoid. A part of that, you should be good to move uh, with the available procedures locally. Super. I have one last question and then we're going to jump yeah. back in again. Uh, Fatma has asked if she can trademark a baked good. She said she's noticed that many competitors have copied. Should the trademark be the name of the baked product as some can recreate it and name it differently? Baked product? A baked product, like maybe a cake or a dessert of some kind or something. The name of that product can be protected as a trademark. So if you have a name of that particular baked product and you feel that name is distinctive, you should go and register it for the products that relates to class 29 and 30, which is the foods item. One of the things that I probably did not explain it is that when you register a trademark, there are 45 classes you need to pick between goods and services. The protection will be for your particular goods and services that you select for your protection. So, so long as you have those items created and you have something that is very uh, well known and it's the main item on your menu or your place or in your uh, selling a platform, maybe it's worth to register that name as a trademark. But generally speaking, when you have uh, different items and you have different menus, the setup of those menus and the way how you created it, you can get it protected as a copyright and claim protection as a copyright. If it's an identical copying of it, you can stop it. If someone is picking some of those items and they do their own reorganizing of it and they are moving for a different and original type of concept, then probably you're gonna have a limited options against it. So in, to pick an example, if you see McDonald's, they move and they register all their item like Big Mac sandwich as a trademark by itself. So no one can move and use that particular item. And it's the same things apply for you. If you have a baked item that is very uh, distinctive and it's very uh, phenomenal and you want to get an exclusivity on that particular name, go ahead and register it for the foods item and for the foods products and you will be able to stop third party from using that name. 
Excellent. Okay, there's still lots more, but I think we'll jump back into things and then sure. we'll cover some more topics. Thank you sure. so much. So from what I see your answers, most of you have picked it up right. All of you have answered correct. When you pick a mark, you need to get it memor memorable and you need to have it appealing and you need to get it protectable one. And you need to have an appropriate mark that is not in violation of public orders. And most importantly, you need to make sure that it's available and it's not owned and claimed by third party. So the most correct answers is that almost 62% uh, of the audiences who put all of the above, who I appreciate the fact that they are grasping the fact that their trademark needs to be carefully selected and it has to be extremely uh, 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 complex when it comes to, to the elements that you want it in your brand. But all of these, types and all of these elements. And I would appreciate if you take a screenshot of it, just remember all these elements when you pick a brand or when you pick a trademark for your businesses, for your products, for your sub products, that these things are always considered. Okay. So I'm just gonna give you a quick brief about the type of the trademarks. So picking up on the previous all that we've done. When you pick a term, when you pick any type of word that you wanted to use it in your business and you say that I wanted this to be a trademark, always remember that you have those type of uh, uh, trademarks. The term when it comes to us, it will be categorized to actually five categories, not only four, but the fourth one, the the fourth one, it's, it's, it's just being missed here just to keep it very simple for you. So the first one is fanciful. If you pick a term for something that has no meaning, that is just completely made up and does not mean anything, that is the most strong, the strongest term that you can use for your brand. So that's what we call fanciful or coin. And a very good example of that is, is, is probably Yahoo that we are all aware of, uh, or, or Kodak, the very, or Coca-Cola. That is the, those type of uh, terms that they were coined, made up by their owner. And it has nothing to do with any of the normal vocabularies or terms that we are aware of. And it's not something that pre-exists in the people's uh, mind. If you pick that term, that is likely it's going to be fancy. And it's gonna be the most strongest, the strongest type of trademark. When I say strongest, that's mean it's gonna be easier for registration. It's gonna have a very broad protection from someone else to use something similar because people will know that this is the trademark that is distinguished and nobody can uh, come close to it or anyone who will use something similar will cause a consumer confusion. There is something we call arbitrary and suggestive. There is arbitrary, Trademark, the arbitrary is some mark that has a word in our normal vocabulary, in our normal dictionary, but it's being used for a different type of products. The very good example we have is what we call um, uh, uh, the Windows system. Windows is a word that is exists in the dictionary, but the owners, the Bill Gates and the Microsoft, they decide to use it for, uh, for the computer program. Apple. Apple is something that is everyone is aware of the term. We can not stop anyone from using Apple in selling the Apple products. But when it comes to electronics, they get an exclusivity on it because they use a term for a totally different products or services that the term is being normally used. And that's what we call an arbitrary term. Suggestive, suggestive terms that something can put in your imagination as a trademark owner something to relate to the services that you provide. The very well good example in the hotels industry is what we call the Holiday Inn. Holiday Inn is one of the very well-known brands in the, uh, uh, in the hospitality sector. And it gives the impression and the suggestion for the consumers that they're gonna come and spend the holiday there. It's a very strong trademark and it's inherently protectable and inherently distinctive. The two marks that we have them here, which are the type of the terms that unfortunately a lot of business owners, they fall in the trap with it, which is the descriptive and generic. Try as much as you can when you pick your brand 
to avoid these two terms. First, generic marks, this has no protection. So whatever you spend on your term of marketing, it's basically a waste. It's a waste of your time and investment and your money because you are not gonna be able to claim exclusivity on the term or the brand that you will be using it and the one or prohibit third party from using it. So don't use generic terms for the products that you are selling or the services you're providing for your trademark. This is just gonna take you nowhere. Even if you get a registration, sometimes the trademark offices in some countries, they grant registration for generic term because they have a lousy examination process. They don't do a very intensive examination. So the owner think that he has exclusivity on it, but in reality, it does not entitle you to anything. So if you move and you register a shop for the shop to run a shop, you're not going to get a protection on the term and everyone else can use that term. If you move and register a chair to sell chair products, this is something that's going to help you. Because even if you build your consumer's database and you have a very good product, third party can come and use the same term. They will still going to be able to open the same brand and they will be able to use the same term without any issue. And it can cause a consumer confusion. And this applies for everything you have. So the generic term is the term that describe or the term that is the name of the things that you are selling or the service that you provided. So back in my Apple question, if you are opening a shop to sell Apple and you call it Apple, this is by itself is a generic term and nobody can stop anyone from using Apple to sell Apple products as the fruits. Descriptive term. Descriptive term is where most of the tricky part happened. Some people try to use a descriptive for their business, trying to say that we are informing the consumers about our brand so they can come and use our services or buy our products. Descriptive, it's a tricky one because it's a weak trademark unless it become really well known where people will become aware of, uh, of the source of the product and then probably gonna entitle the brand owner to have some exclusivity, but with a very cautious protection to third parties. The very good example that we have is Emirates. Emirates airline is a descriptive for the national airliners or transportation uh, services um, to, the, to the public. It's not a generic term, it's more of a descriptive to show that this is the national uh, uh, airliners for, uh, for, for the people in, in, in the UAE or in the Emirates. So this term Emirates is a descriptive, but it acquired a protection and it become one of the most well-known trademark later on that can prohibit third party or any company from setting up an airlines and called Emirates. But it took them a lot of efforts and time and, 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 and investment to reach to that level. So when you pick a descriptive term, look at yourself. Are you gonna be able to make it very well known and distinctive in a way that you will be able to get that status? So that's why we always advise clients or brand owners or IP owners, small business, medium-sized business, even the big corporation, to make sure that the mark is protectable and it's available and it's something that you will pick one of the three terms, whether it's a fanciful, arbitrary or suggestive, because these are the inherently protectable uh, terms. Is the trademark available? How can I know that? That's a question that raised by one of, uh, one of my clients. It seems to be very simple, but it has been there. And I think it's the question that everyone has. I picked the brand. I like the artworks that I've done it on that brand. I've developed a logo and slogan. How can I make it available? How can I know if it's available? The first things you need to do is to do a trademark search before investment. There is official searches, you can run it. And it's, there's a lot of database can help you. What are the prior rights? And you will be surprised how many trademarks that they are registered that you're not aware of. Always remember, not only the trademarks or the brands or the products name or the service name that you are aware of are the one that is there. You are probably only aware of the one that is well known. So make sure that you run this exercise. It's not a mandatory exercise, but it's absolutely 
if I were in your shoes and if I were in a business owner who wants to do an investment in marketing or on any type of uh, uh, businesses, to make sure that you run that availability search. And it's pretty, really cost effective when it compared to the registration. It's not that expensive. It's probably less than 20% of the entire cost that you would spend when you do the registration. Once you run that one, see what other people have and what their marks is, get the advice on that. And the part party you are picking to give you the advice should give you the implication of you want to proceed with the term that you picked and what are gonna be the likely outcomes if you go into a dispute with a person who, or an entity that claim ownership on similar marks. Always think broadly and look at the big picture. If you are a local business owner, look at yourself after five years or seven years, are you gonna stay locally here in the UAE or are you gonna go abroad? Are you gonna to go to the GCC? Are you gonna go for any other countries in the world? Are you gonna manufacture from those countries? Are you gonna import products from those countries? All these questions, ask them for yourself before you pick the brand and move with the protection and registration. Once you have a proper visibility, move strategically and get the registration and protection in each of those countries. I picked on a very good example of the uh, Gabriella Chanel, who become aware of, uh, who become uh, uh, the very uh, well-known uh, fashion designers in 1910 later become aware and her nickname become Coco Chanel. This lady was just a designer and she was doing her own artworks and she started to build and invest in her brand where she bring a very impressive uh, fabrics and a very impressive clothing. I and mean, she's a, one of the successful uh, stories. She had her partner with her and her partner, uh, I forget his name, it's on the top of my head, but her partner who was working with her Currently, his grandsons are the ones who own Chanel. They are the people who are benefiting from what their grandfathers and all his partners did 100 years ago. So if you really want to build a legacy for your future, I know this is something we care about here, and we care about our families, we care about our successions. Think about building a strong and very good brand if you have the talent to create a certain products, because this is something that we can do. I don't see any reason why we don't have, a, we have a talented woman that are based here and they are in our region and in the UAE that they've done massive work, massive uh, success in that particular industry. I know one of the lady that I worked with her, she developed designs that was adopted and bought by Adidas to become a very uh, exclusive for her to do all the training for the Eastern and Middle Eastern women. If you have the talent to do that, if you have the talent to create perfumes, like the people who are part of the perfumes industries and they are with us today, think about building your stronger brand and invest on it. But before you do the investment, make sure that you run all the process of picking the right brand and get the right people to work with you. Why to register your trademark? I mean, a part of what I've mentioned before, let me just think of an analogy. If you get a land or if you get a piece of property or an apartment and you want to buy it, you can sign a contract with a developer or with the prior owners of these rights. But would you dare to pay all the fund or the money to buy that assets without going and get that registration from the land department? I'd assume 100% of the people in this uh, session will say no. It's exactly the same for your trademark. The fact that DED or the free zone or any authority where your company is incorporated does not require from you to show your trademark registration, that does not mean that it's not mandatory for you, at least from commercial point of view. It's an asset you are investing on, you are building, you are creating. Make sure that you go and register it because it proves your ownership, it helps you in enforcement, it allows you to license it, and it just let you have a peace of mind, a shield, if someone wanna come and attack your businesses in the future. It will also make your enforcement work very simple. You will be surprised how many people come to me after they use their mark for many, many years and they neglected that part. And they spent 10 times of what it would cost them to go and do the registration and the protection. 
So please don't ever neg neglect this procedure. For the people who do the products and the merchandise and the products, when you have that registration, you can move and record your mark at the customs. The customs authorities in many countries, including the UAE, they have a specialized IP department. They will inspect the shipments that come on board. They will report to you if they become suspicious about any of your marks are being infringed, and they will ask you to come and do the necessary to verify the source of the products or to file a complaint to stop it or not to allow it to enter to the market. So it's like a proactive action. They take it from their side. If you have that registration, you will be entitled to request that. And that's going to save a lot of cost on you, a lot of, 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 of business opportunity that you might lose from the local market when consumers use uh, some counterfeit or an infringing products of your trademarks. Any question about the trademarks before I move to the patent? Uh, would you like to take any, take any, would you like us to take any question? Uh, yeah, let's do, let, let's do a few more. Um, sure. There's a question from Melissa who said that she has an ongoing reproduction of our designs by many UAE businesses. So basically other UAE, UAE based businesses are copying her designs. They get sent images of our products and um, it, that are being used in someone's home and they get asked to make copies of them. How can I ever protect my designs? Even with the costly registrations, I would not be able to stop this. Any ideas? I'm going to talk about the enforcement at the end of after the patent, but in a brief, okay. in a brief, what you are facing is something that is very common. And that's something most of the IP and brand owners or even the industrial designs owners, they face it. And you cannot stop it, but you can react with it. And the more you react aggressively, the more that those criminals, I call them criminals because they violate the penal codes, they violate the, the, all the, the sanctions and they are subject to the sanctions in the UAE and the penalties. The more they will just find out a different way to deal with it and they will probably infringe some other designs. But if they stick with your designs, if it sticks with your works, that's first of all, a sign of your success. That's a sign that you are doing something very distinctive and it's worth a business worth and a commercial worth. Don't give up. If someone wants to come and you are driving a great car and someone wants to take it from you, you will resist, you will stop it, you will park it in your garage, you will call the police to support you. It's exactly the same analogy here. It might be costly at the beginning, but it's never costly. It's never costly on the long term, especially if you have a successful concept. Uh, what I would advise you to do is to try to look at the cost effective uh, campaign for such. Uh, an enforcement uh, priority for you is to classify your IP rights from the designs that you have. Uh, industrial designs might be a very uh, unfavorable for, for, for the IP owners to get it, at least in some countries, because the process of registration is difficult. The scope of protection might be extremely uh, uh, shallow. Uh, you might walk for law enforcement. They might not understand how to get you the rights properly. So we do a lot of alternative way to protect your works. We run for a copyright or a trademarks when it's possible for the shape of your products or for the shape of your designs, if it's possible. And we try to enforce it in that way so we can at least have a great cooperation by the law enforcement. So when you get an advice, and it should not take more than half an hour or an hour advice with your counsel to look at what you have and to tell you how to deal with it. It can become a, by way of creating a template of legal notices and just to go and attack those people by your external counsel, they will immediately back off. And it worked in many cases, by the way, because as I said, these are criminals. There is a lot of these criminals, they have uh, 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 something in the back of their mind where they're really scared. If they got caught, they don't want to be there in trouble. So they will immediately back off. There are some of them, they are rude and they're going to keep consistent and they're going to be... Yeah. Uh, aggressive, but these are the minority of them because they do something wrong and they know that if they're going to get caught, they will be in a problem. So seek an advice. Don't try to deal with it by yourself. It's not like uh, something that you can have someone in-house to do it because it's not something that normally we see the IP owners will think of doing it from their own side. But there is always a way to deal with it in a very cost-effective way and in a very 
a practical way. So Munir, one, one thing that another person pointed out is they said a lot of times the supplier or printer don't realize they're copying a local business. They're sent ideas from Pinterest or Google. Do you take action against the printer supplier or the client who is taking your design to someone else? Anyone who is involved in the process of infringing an IP rights is someone who uh, you can approach and someone you can take the action against. Uh, the contributory infringement is one of the theories that is in the US that allow the IP owners to move for the medium platform that allow the infringements to be there. So there is no straightforward answer for your question before we look at the case, but that's why you see all of the social media uh, platforms, they immediately react with the IP owners because if they don't react, they might be liable for facilitating the infringements. So in principle, you should go against the entity behind that and the person or the account that is doing that. But even if there is any uh, third party who is facilitating it, they should be able to do it. If you go for the, even the platform, that the online platform, Souk, uh, Amazons, um, uh, Alibaba's, all of the well-known e-commerce platforms, they have their own policies and they are obliged to do it. It's not an option anymore because they might be exposed for liabilities if they don't do that. And this is something that you always need to bear in mind that you need to press as much as you can. Now, lately in some countries, we start to see the credit card owners or the companies that run Visa or Master, they are working with the brand owners because they don't want to be exposed for liability. Although they're just uh, uh, facilitating the bank accounts and financials, so they have nothing to do with the activities. But in some countries, uh, especially for the online activities, they can be exposed. So they will work with you. They will support you. It's a know-how on how to deal with your problem rather than having the mechanism because the mechanism is there. The mechanism is there. It's everywhere. And the laws supported it. And in the UAE, I would say we are very fortunate with the level of the advancements of the regulations. We have it. We have the advanced IP protection regulations. We have the advanced cybercrime regulation that have a very hefty sanctions against any party who use the e-commerce for conducting these activities. It's about how you provoke this protection and try to put it in the front of your infringers to stop the, the infringements and the violation of your rights. That's great. Okay, I'm gonna give you a couple of other quick questions and then we'll take more at the end. Yeah. So just looking at a few more on trademarks as well. So someone wants to know how can i know that uh, a trademark is not registered in another country is there a directory available to search in beautiful there's a lot of countries they put their trademark database online so you can go there and you can run and see uh, other countries they require a physical search where you need to approach the ministry and pay official fees for it things are progressing very well what i would advise you and that's not an official search Always we advise the clients to do official search. But what I would advise you, go for something called trademark search at WIPO. WIPO, that is W-I-P-O. They will get you to a database of substantial number of the countries globally. Uh, you just put the term that you want. It's a very friendly user. Uh, don't panic when you look at the boxes. Don't feel that you're not going to know how to do it. Just put the term there in the search and run it it will give you the numbers of the marks and it will give you the acronym of the country where this mark is registered. Again, this is not an official search, it's just a database that everyone can use. But my advice to you is to run always an official search in the countries of interest. So if you want to use it in the UAE for a certain product, you're not supposed to go and run the search globally. You're not required to do that. You require to do the official search in the UAE and based on the results, you will be advised whether you will need to do subsequent searches or there is no need to do that. Uh, but I would advise you to go for that WIPO registry. It's, 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 it's something that can be very helpful to at least have a flavor how common is the brand and who owns it and where it's owned. Excellent. Now, um, this one gets asked quite a lot as well is what is the best option to trademark by brand, logo, company name, or both together? Well, this is, this is a very uh, common question. And uh, what I would advise you to do is all depend on your resources. Some of the brand owners, they come, should I do the colors? 
Should I protect the colors? Am I eligible to do the colors? Yes, there are a lot of brands. They are they build their fame based on the color. The very well-known Vodafone telecommunications, they build it based on the red color. Orange, which we all know in other countries, they're based on, on the orange color. Uh, it is a lot that we have it here. It's based on the green. Uh, the color could be something that is very important to look at. Two quick advice I would give. If you register your brand in black and white, in most of the countries, you get the protection for all the colors. However, if you're gonna invest in a certain color and all your campaign will go for a certain color, try to protect that color with your logo. Now back to your question, should I do the logo or the word or the shape? It depends on where's your equity. What are you going to market? What are you gonna use in the advertisements? I always advise to protect the word mark and the logo if they are being used separately. But if they are used together and most of the time, or there is a stylized word mark, you can combine them both and get them in one. You can combine them both and get them all registered in one application. Also, your budget has a call on this. If you have a limited budget at this stage, try to protect as much as you can. But always put it as part of your annual expense on your balance sheet, on your expense sheet, how to protect my IP rights and keep it to accumulate. Have a strategy now and after two or three years, revisit it and see how I can expand in protection. How can I protect more and more of my elements? You're not required to spend all your capital in protecting your IP rights, but keep it as an organic expense that is on your balance sheet on a yearly basis so you can have the right to protect on and also enforce. You will be surprised that 85% of the value of Coca-Cola or 92% of the value of Apple, it's all in intellectual property. The $1 trillion business, it's not about factories. It's not about employment. It's, like, it's about their patent, their IP rights, their intangible assets that they managed to protect and secure and here where they get the valuation. So put it as part of your provision. And this is unfortunate in the culture of the business that we see here, which I'm sure you will be leading this very well for your startup business because you know how to do the right thing for your right and your best interest. And when you do it, you will see the most of the businesses will follow the same. So, okay, and another quick question for you. Yeah. People are talking about can they register the trademark of their company if it's not registered in the UAE, but they sell locally to the UAE market? And then there's another question, which is similar about um, if they're selling to another country, they're based in the UAE, but maybe selling in China or something else, how can they protect, protect their trademark there? So yeah. two sides of the same point. It's, it's jurisdictional, as I said, protect it in the country where you have your business or your potential business. So if you are manufacturing products in X country and you are importing it to the UAE only and you're selling it only in the UAE, first choice for you is the UAE, you have to get the protection here. Second choice to avoid your products from being seized, from being in a problem in other countries, go for that country and make sure that your product is registered there as well. And the trademark is registered there so you don't face any problem in the future. Uh, you have to protect it in both countries, in my view, and because most of the trademark laws, it prohibits third party from using, manufacturing, importing, offering to sell, sell any product that infringe with the pre-existing trademarks. So if your brand becomes successful and registered in the UAE, and let's assume third party has the same brand in China, India, or any other countries where you get your product supplied from, think about a potential risk where they can come and attack you in that country and try to confiscate your shipments or consignments if they become aware of it. Some other countries, they have a special regulation where they say, if there is a product that's only for exporting purposes, it does not apply for the local laws, and this is something we see it very common. So they either have a free zones or they have a special arrangements or special bilateral agreements because they are manufacturing countries. Uh, those are exception. I would not really build on them. I would live with one rule. If you have a brand and you have it registered in your country on your market, this is the first priority, but don't neglect to go and register it also at the country where you are manufacturing or you are sourcing your products from. 
Super, thanks Munir. Okay, I'm gonna move it along because we've got about 10 minutes and we can stick sure. around for questions after, but I wanna give you time to address patents and also enforcement sure. as well. So over to you. Sure. Now the patent is something that I'm sure you are all aware of it. Everyone, I mean, a lot of uh, businesses comes to me and they say, we wanna patent something. And uh, when I hear the word patent, I feel that uh, it's either they are misinformed about the patent or they really have something big that they wanna protect it. Among all the IP rights that I mentioned, patent is the most sophisticated one. It is a process that is very uh, extensive. The protection and the prosecution of a patent requires a lot of requirements, a lot of uh, uh, delegations, and a lot of technical knowledge. Uh, it's good to know about the term. It's good to know what it means. I probably mentioned before that it's the invention is uh, 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 is something that is a novel or it's something that you bring it as a new uh, for the industry or a solution for the for the industries that can be eligible for a patent. Uh, what I will try to do is we'll try to tell you if you have a patent, what you will be able to get. If, if you, let's say, come up with an invention like a new drugs or a new vaccination for a pandemic or, or something you were able to deliver it because you are very skillful in what you are doing, and something that does not have any prior arts or any things that is in the market, not only locally, but also globally, you have the right to move and request for patent protection. The patent protection is very long and it's very uh, costly compared to the other IP rights. And mostly it's something that will have a lot of difficulty to enforce. And that's why you see a lot of patents get adopted by corporates, or by individuals who are funded by a third party or an angel investors or even a governmental based organization to support them and get them the patent and get the protection. But once you have a patent, you will have the right to exclude others from using your invention unless they come and take your authorization and take your license. There are two types of, 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 of common knowns patent. There is the utility or design patents, and there is the patent requirements that I will sum up some of them, although there are a lot of others, but these things that you need to be aware of. It has to be absolutely novel. It's mean absolutely novel that is new, that has never been in the market, that has never been even disclosed. Now there is a new change of the law that just has been enacted by the UAE government, which we expect to be to have it enforced by the end of the year. But as of now, if you become aware of an invention or if you reach an invention, and let's assume you were in one of these lectures speaking with us and all of your peers are there and you were so excited about it and you just announce it and you say, I become aware of um, a cure for the HIV, for instance, and this is the formula of it. This is going to strike the novelty and will make your patent in the public domain. So absolute novelty is always something that patent is required. So when you file the patent application, you have to sign it as a confidential and to say this is confidential information. It has never been disclosed. It is something that has been kept classified by the patent. It should have an industrial use where it has to be something that the relevant industry are using it, are able to, uh, 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 are able to uh, uh, utilize it and are able to build uh, some, uh, some benefits out of it. And it should not be obvious. So it has one of the terms that it's something that it should not be obvious. It's not something that has been there in, uh, uh, in the market, but no one has been able. So it will need and require some technical and some intensive work. And it should be enablement, should, should, should allow uh, when third party are able to look at your patent application or your patent specifications, they will be able to use it and will be able to reproduce it. Because the concept of the patent is that when you wanna get the protection, you should disclose all the specifications that relate to that invention. So you have to prepare a very comprehensive patent application and patent drafting for your patent and your invention. You will have to put an abstract, you'll have to put the specimens, you have to list the prior arts, and you should show the best way and the best mode of how to, uh, uh, to manufacture or how to utilize that invention. 
So any person in that particular industry can read it and can be able and enable to create the product or to, in, to make that invention. So in return of that disclosure, as a patentee, you will have the right to exclude others from using your invention without coming to you as a patentee and to get the rights and to get the financial uh, benefits out of it. It's very limited, it's for 20 years, and it requires the patentee to pay an annuity fees, a, month, a, a yearly annuity fees to the government to maintain the patent. It's very delicate type of IP rights. It requires a very specialized, even specialized external attorneys to help you. In the US and the EU and many other countries, patent lawyers, they have a special qualification. They have a special bars in addition to the bar that lawyers get. They normally get a background of the technical and engineering or pharmaceuticals or whatever specialty they have. So it's not like something that anyone or any person can move and claim patent rights uh, or get engaged with the patent lawyers to do the patent drafting without having the solid uh, knowledge about the procedures, the formalities, and the way how to do the patent. Because missing any one of those elements can always result to lose the patent protection and make it in the public domain. I want to share with you a very interesting story about uh, uh, Mary Kais. Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware of this girl or how many of you are aware of, of, of this lady, but this lady, if she was the first woman to register and own a patent in the USA. That was back in 18th century. Uh, it's a very funny story because I don't know, uh, but when I read about her, I was really surprised and I felt that I want to share her story with you. Up to 1790, women were not eligible to claim or to have a patent rights or to even claim any properties or to register any properties. They were not able to claim any rights, anything, any properties they wanna own, it should be registered in the name of their husbands or the name of their father as being the male that are dominant. But as things has changed at that time, uh, there was a new uh, proposition to allow women to own rights and to own properties. She was the first woman to move and apply for a patent. And her patent was really uh, interesting because it came from the necessity. She was able to uh, create or to come up with the hat. That hat that we see it in the picture was very useful, was very new, and it has a special designs where it allowed the, uh, the women who are working, the field workers, to be able to use it. At that time, when I read more about the history of it, all these type of hats used to be imported from France and from the EU. But when Napoleon came up and took the power, he put some uh, restriction on the importations and there was some issues going on. So the U.S. stopped all the importation from, from, from EU. That resulted for her to come up with this uh, uh, new designs for a hat that can protect all the women who are working in the field uh, to keep uh, some sort of uh, protection on their head. And she moved and registered it as a patent. So it was the first woman to get that hat and to get that patent under the new amendment, 1809. And after that, that uh, here's the hat and here's how it looks. <coughs> and she was able to get an exclusivity on it. And all the manufacturers who were manufacturing these hats, they had to pay her royalty and had to pay her the funds for exploiting that, that hat. It's a very inspiration story. It comes from a great background and a great uh, uh, innovative lady that lived at an area of time where things were going uh, differently, but it shows how things can be as simple as, as a hat where you can have the protection. Now, we get a lot of, if you go for uh, a patent search or prior search, you will see a lot of patents on the helmets or different type of hats or different type of utility patents or designs patents in the US, as well as many other countries simply because they come up with a new idea that is very useful and it's something that will have a market. Now in the UAE, if you want to register this hat, you have many ways to protect it. 
You can protect it as a design. You can protect it as a trademark if you want. The shape of the hat itself, it can be protected as a trademark because it's a shape of product. And if you develop different versions of the hats and different colors, you can probably claim copyright protection. So the good thing about the UAE laws, it gives you a flexibility where you can protect different type of rights or claim different type of intellectual property rights on things that you feel that it will be categorized only for one type of assets. Quick uh, brief before we wrap up for today and uh, why to file the patents. I just need to, to really rush because uh, uh, for the sake of time, it, it's always going to control competition. It's always going to give you a profit. It will enhance the value of your company. The companies that has patents always have uh, an interest from the big corporates. It will help you to reduce all the thefts, whether internally or externally, and it will definitely attract investments. When you have a third party's investment and in capital, they will come and look for the companies that respect their IP rights and they have some patent rights that they can acquire because they know this patent will eligible them to expand and to get a protection for a certain period of time. Uh, there are many steps to secure protection. Uh, always assess your invention to make sure that it meets the requirement. And again, you need an advice. Conduct the patent search. Make sure that what is the prior patents. A lot of people, they might think they can play around with the system. They think that if the patent is registered only in the US, they can come and try to register it here. Uh, there is a very well-known cases where big corporates here in the UAE, they were a victim of this action. All this get thrown away, all these things get uh, striked off because thefting of a patent and trying to uh, register a patent that is in third world or in different countries does not eligible you to get a protection nationally. It's not like the trademark where the search is done only locally. The patent protection system, it goes for an international examination to make sure that the patentee is actually eligible for his patent protection. So once you have that, done and you get the right and you get the right advice from your counsel to say you are, your invention is actually eligible for a patent, move and file it nationally. And after you move it and file it nationally, you will have a priority to go and secure it in many other countries in the world up to 30 months. During this 30 months period, you can even have, uh, you can either have uh, financial support and investors or partners who will be willing and to think of your, of your invention and to support it. So don't panic, don't go and think that you have to do the protection all over the world. Don't feel that you are obliged to do the protection globally and spend millions. It's not like that. You can do it with national filing and you do the protection and then you strategically think of how to go in the future. The PCT and the Paris, this is all international conventions where all the countries and have the treaties where they can protect their inventors and protect their rights and give them some space and we to go and claim as wide as a protection as possible. Just to recap really quick on the IP assets and the strategies, before I move to the enforcements, my last slides after this one, I want you to be sure that you need to uh, always, always be selective with your rights and identify where they have fallen. And this is something you can get it, from your own sense, or you can seek an advice. It should not take a lot of your resources or financial resources to get an advice. A one hour with an intellectual property lawyer, and there are a bunch of them here in the UAE and in the region, can help you to classify and to tell you what exactly your intangible assets fall under which category and what are the measures you need to do the protection. Once you become aware of it and you believe on it, move and protect. Don't wait for the emergency to come to move and to protect. Do it as part of your mindset. Exploit your rights commercially. So after you move and protect it, make sure that you go viable about it. You go public about it. Make sure that you reach out to potential investors. If you have a copyright, speak to a publisher. Uh, Harry Potter only become published and become what it is because it gets in the hand of a right publisher. So if you are an author or if you are a designer, go and think of with whom you should propose your, your, your piece of work. Don't sit and wait for it to come over for you. Manage your expectations on the rights and enforcement. I like the question on the lady that she said that I have designed, someone is sending it to me. Should I do it? I feel that I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, 
paralyzed. I cannot really move and stop everyone. Manage your expectations. Think of it as it's one of your business risk, one of your business issues that you have to deal with when it comes to uh, what is happening in the market when you monitor the market. But also manage your expectations on what is the return that you're going to get from your rights if you exploit it. And what is the returns if you move with the enforcement? Move strategically and wisely because this is going to help you to sustain your IP rights and to get the protection, whether it's a trademark or any other type of rights that you manage to develop and manage. Finally, just in a quick uh, way, you have the rights, you protect it, you registered it, you have your business running without any problem. And then you start to see someone is trying to either hijack your rights or try to infringe it or try to free write on it or use something similar. So if you have a trademark and someone is trying to use something very much similar to what you have with a changing a letter or a color, what am I supposed to do? What are my options? Again, seek an advice will tell you what exactly your option, but just for you to know where you stand. If you have an IP rights and there is a situation of infringement, piracy, counterfeiting, any type of violations you have of your rights, you can always start by serving a notice for the infringer. This is someone that you has to be put a notice. Most of the infringers, as I said, they are criminals. They are doing the wrong thing. When you put them under the spotlight, they will back off in most of the situation. A lot of IP owners and brand owners, when they approach us and we just send a letter, they cause a complete panic for the shop owner or for the trader. Some of the trader, they don't probably know because there's a lot of brands out there some of them, they are a victim of a wholesaler or a distributor. Some of them, they are part of the business. Let's assume the good faith always if we are talking about the retailers or, or someone who is doing it in public because or they're doing it online. They're unlikely to become aware of the implications of what they are doing. That's a cost-effective process and it could resolve the issue and stop the problem for you. If not, there are three other options to move with a physical enforcement. And we are lucky in the UAE to have the administrative action option. Administrative action is not always available in many other countries. And some countries, they face a lot of difficulties to go with an administrative action. Administrative action, when I mentioned, that's been the government, whether it's an economic department or a customs authorities that, or the Ministry of Economy, they can take the complaint from the IP owner and they move and they have their inspectors to go against a trader. They confiscate the product, they impose a fine, and that's without involving you in any of the civil or criminal action or a court action. A lot of business owners and IP owners, they don't prefer to go into that route. So that's one of the options which you can always explore and see if it's fit for your issue. Always remember that anyone who is violating your IP rights is a criminal and is someone who can be taken to the police. In Dubai, for instance, or in Abu Dhabi, they both have a specialized in the CID, specialized units that only takes care of complaints in relation to the intellectual property or trademark infringements. Speak to them, they are open, they are efficient. They do that on a day-to-day basis. They go against, normally they go against big fish. They go against big uh, wholesalers. They go against storage warehouses, but they also receive complaints for small issues because it's your rights as a residence or as a national in the UAE to take that step. And they will be very helpful and supportive. All what you need to do when you walk to them get some basic information about your rights, your trademark registration certificates that you have in front of the ministry, if it's a trademark issue, and take for them your product and the issue that you face. They're probably gonna help you. If not, or if they don't really feel that you wanna do that step, seek a, a help from a council. And again, there are a bunch of them here in the UAE. They can always help you with the budget that you have it for that task. Lastly, but not least, there is a civil action option. You can go for Dubai court or Abu Dhabi court or any of the Sharjah court. Sharjah, they have, forget to mention something, Sharjah have a very efficient system on all the three levels, administrative, criminal, and civil. And they are extremely active because there's a lot of warehouses and a lot of traders who try to misuse the fact that Sharjah is a very friendly uh, emirate when it comes to a setup of business, cost-effective but they have an excellent team that they take care of anti-piracy and anti-counterfeitings. You can approach them. They have a special unit in the police and the CID as well. 
and they are very supportive. They don't even, sometimes they don't, I mean, it's all free of charge when it comes to the criminal action, but even for administrative action, their fees and their inspection fees can be very flexible if they see you as a small uh, business or someone who's really victim of things that uh, it's not happening unfairly. So uh, all of the three Emirates, among others, but all these three Emirates, they have a very sufficient and very well-established uh, system to allow and to work on the enforcement. Civil action, you can also said, go for a claiming of damages and compensations and all the available remedies. In the civil action, if you go for a court and there is a proof that there is an infringement of your trademarks, you can request from the judge that when the judgment is issued, you can have it published in local newspaper at the cost of the defendant. So you will have that mentioned in the newspaper, mentioning the full details of the incident, including the name of the infringer and the name of your brand, which will be very helpful, not only to put that defendant on their spot, but also to let you spread a cautionary notices for most of the industry who are willing to violate your IP rights or try to capitalize your trademarks, they will become aware that this brand or this owner, let's not even deal with them because they will take it all the way to the end. They will probably stop doing that for your products or they will opt for another brand or other issues to deal with, which can resolve the problem for you and that you close this chapter. So this is basically what I have. Uh, from my side, I'm done. Uh, Jen, I'm happy to uh, take any more questions for the sake of time. Otherwise, I will leave uh, the poll for you. Do you want me to? Oh, Munir, I have so many questions for you. And thank you so much, ladies, for submitting all of your questions. What I am going to do, uh, because we are running a few minutes late, that what I want to do is just please, everybody, if you could fill in the polls, because it really helps UN Women and NAMA Women Advancement Establishment. Just get a, a snapshot about how these online workshops are benefiting you and if uh, you did take something away from this. So I'd be really grateful if you could please answer both of these questions and we'll move into a few more questions but before we do for anybody who needs to drop off I'm just going to show you Munir if you could just advance two slides that at the end here we have a list of some of the other training workshops that are coming up just so you can see if there's anything that might benefit you so just the next slide as well please Munir and you'll see here, so next week, if you're an Arabic speaker, we have a phenomenal workshop next week that's going to be on how to write better business copy in Arabic. So there's going to be an email going out shortly about that. And that is next Tuesday, the 28th of September. And then on Monday, the 4th of October, we have a workshop on how to get your product stocked. And this is going to be a really practical session on explaining to you if you have products, how you can talk to shops, how you can talk to, to different companies to get them to stock your product. And then on the 27th of October, we have a more advanced workshop, which is on how to plan for selling or investment as well. So we have lots and lots and lots of really great workshops coming up and there's more as well but look out for those emails if you are not on the UN women mailing list please do contact us uh, Munir maybe if you can just move to the next slide the email address I think the next one after that the email address for UN women uh, is on there I think it sorry. is maybe not um no. uh, sorry that's okay um if, if anybody doesn't know how to reach UN women I think you know where to find us because you found out this workshop anyway. So you'll know how to find us and I'll put the email address in the chat as we're going on. If I can please ask you, only 60% of you have completed the poll as well. So I'd be really grateful just if, if you could because it really benefits you and women as well to be able to get that feedback. A few people have messaged me and said, how do I get a copy of this really useful workshop? It is being recorded and you will get an email from you and women showing you how you can access the the workshop as well. So I'm going to sign off quickly just for anybody who has to leave. 
absolutely no problem. I'd just like to thank you for giving us your time today to listen to this and also as well to Munir for providing such a detailed and insightful look about how we can look at trademarking and intellectual property. And given the amount of questions that we have, there's a lot of questions that people have, so we'll pick it up afterwards. But thank you so much for your time today, Munir, and for supporting all of the women entrepreneurs in the UAE as well. Okay, let's go to some of these questions. So, Munir, one question we've been asked several times is around money and costs. And I'm going to ask you a few parts because I think there's a number of questions that you'll be able to answer at the same time. So one business owner has asked, is it worth protecting your intellectual property as an SME? As the legal costs are very prohibitive for SMEs, it makes it difficult to enforce any IP rights. And then uh, we've had lots of questions about how much does it cost and a number of questions about are we going to be charged yearly or what are the, the costs? And last question is, can I do it myself or do I have to do it through a lawyer? So those are the big ones all together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure, sure. I mean, the cost varies on which assets you are picking to do. As I said, some... Copyrights, for instance, it's very uh, cost effective and it can be registered in less than $100 fees and official fees. The problem with registering IP rights, um, something that you now need to be aware of, is that you need to be aware of the fact that there are official fees to get that assets protection. When you put the official fees in the equation, it might get things differently uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, your budgeting and your concern. But having said that, there is always options to deal, as I said, with limited resources just to cure the issue. The only thing that you should not do is just to remain silent and just to leave your rights to go away with someone else to rip it off. It is something that you will have to stand for it, do the protection. There is a minimal way to deal with it. There is a minimal uh, you can do, depend on how valuable is the issue. Uh, the registration, for instance, of copyright varies from the one that's for trademark or for the one that you do for patent. As most of the common rights that SMEs do, speaking on that question, it's mostly trademarks. And the trademarks registration in terms of official fees that you have to pay it once every 10 years uh, during the process of registration, it's not something that will exceed the $2,000 in terms of official fees and publication expenses adding to that any attorney's fees. But as a local company, and as a local licensee company, you can access directly to the portal and you can do it by yourself if you have the courage to do it. And if you have the uh, spare time and you have the interest to do it by yourself. So you will only have to pay the, 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 the ministry fees to get that registration done. When it comes to the enforcement, as I said, there are many options. There's options that can cost you up to 100,000, 150,000 there have to do the enforcement when you want to go into a civil action and litigation. Well, there are some options if you want to take it for the DED, for instance, it can cost probably 20, 20,000 dirhams, including appointing someone to help you to do, to deal with the problem. Well, if you just want to send a letter, a legal notice, just to let them stop from doing what they're doing, the cost might not be that expensive, something that you can really bear it. So it all depends on what is the strategy you want to adopt and how serious is the issue. And that's something you're probably not gonna be able to make a call on it. You will need to have someone to be there like the accountant or the HR specialist, someone who is a legal professional, whether you're external lawyer or your external IP counsel to be able to guide you with these issues and to try to direct you on the options you can take so you can pick and choose what you need to do. Excellent. Um, on that as well, a few people have asked, does IP registration cover all five classifications? Can you say that again, please? So they've asked if IP registration covers all five classifications. So at the beginning of the presentation, you yeah, yeah. listed yeah. the different classifications. There is, yeah. there, is no, there is no things called IP registration. There is nothing like that. It's the IP rights. It's being classified into five different categories. You pick which category is your assets falling and you move with the registration. 
So you have to do either do a trademark registration, copyright registration, or patent registration, or even industrial design registration, or a domain name registration. And each registry has its own process and requirements and fees. So there is nothing called IP registration where you go and you get the registration to cover everything. But the IP rights or IP terminology, it cover all these things uh, uh, under the umbrella. You just need to know under which one of it your rights fits in. Yeah, okay. Our product name has a different meaning in every language. Can someone else claim the brand name is protected just because it has a similar meaning? Well, this is a very tricky question, to be honest with you. And it depends on how similar is the translation. In many laws, including the UAE, the translation of a trademark in a principle could be problematic for you. However, if you manage to show that this translation has nothing to do with the original mark as it's being used, then you might have uh, a, a case to get away with the translation of a trademark in the local language. The very good example we have here is uh, Etihad. Etihad, union, mean union or united. And both terms are being used in totally different uh, line of products or services and by different owners. So the bottom line is that translation could be problematic, but it's not always something you cannot get away with it, depend on the line of the products you are picking your translation for, the shape, the stylized, the different in countries, the different in languages. The key question will be is that whether the consumers will be able to link both marks together. So one of the very good example we have here uh, about the translation is the Mars product. Mars is one of the most well-known trademark globally for the chocolate and confectionery products that are registered under class 29 and 30. We get a lot of people or some businesses that try to register the translation of Mars, uh, which is the planet, in local languages for the same line of the product. This was found to be an infringement and the mark was always rejected from registration or from use. Uh, Galaxy, for instance, Galaxy is the same thing, but you have Samsung using Galaxy for electronic products and uh, even they're using transliteration or sometime a translation for a different line of products and they both coexisted without issue. So it's always something that we have to do. Amar, yeah, that's a very good, very good uh, uh, example. This is, this, is, this is a mark that you cannot have someone to register it in Arabic, but what they normally do, the brand owner, they move and they register it in both languages. They just don't leave it for chances where people can rip off on the translation. Excellent. Okay. We have a ton of questions related to copyright. And so I'm going to pick that up afterwards because there's a couple of other big questions and this does happen sometimes in the UAE. So I think it's important that we talk about this. One is we have two ex-employees who have copied what we do. One, their branding is almost identical, same colors and shapes. Our logo is trademarked. What do we gain by sending a cease and desist order? Will they be forced to change their branding or will we be eligible for any sort of compensation for the damage they've done to our brand with their inferior goods? Well, it's, it's, it's something that uh, you may not be able to have a crystal clear answer for it, but what I would suggest to do is have your brand when you were creating it with these employees, did you get it registered? If you have it registered and it's already protected, so your ownership is proven. So if they moved and they copied the same design, they are an infringer, regardless if they are an ex-employee or current employee or a former employee. So what you need to do is you need to look at where you stand, what type of rights you have. The most common problem that I see is that they have developed something as an employees and the employer for a reason or another neglect to get that brand registered. And then when it goes and the employees move and they uh, start to use a similar brand or to develop their own brands, they will have a struggle on how to deal with that one. So it's a dispute of ownership for sure if there is no registration and it will have to have a lot of elements that we need to look at before you can get an answer 
on whether you have the rights to move and to take actions or even serve a letter or not, because you don't want to end up with serving a letter that is groundless and that has no uh, proper meaning that can either backfire on you or it can actually alert your opponents of doing things that they did not think of doing it. So uh, I hope this gives you a clarity on what you need to do, but it probably is worth to look at yourself and look at your records if you already have registrations for those brands and those packages or not. If not, maybe you need to seek an advice to tell you what you need to do. Okay. Thank you, Munir. We are in an NGO organization. Under this, we have five different initiative programs. Each one has a different brand identity. How do we trademark these initiatives and services? It's very simple and it's very recommended actually. Uh, UN, for example, is one of these well-known trademarks for NGOs and it's, it's a registered trademark. All what you need to do is develop the name and the logo, make sure you clear it. You don't wanna end up with having a mark that is, or a logo or a word that is protected by third party, even if it's an NGOs or non-NGOs. Uh, make sure that you are safe to move and use it, first of all, and safe to register it. And then all what you need to do, this NGOs has to appoint a council, ideally, to do the registrations. We can do that, of course, and they can uh, get for you to select the class that is relevant for the NGO services. There are 45 different classes. On top of my head, I remember class 45 is the one that is relevant to NGOs. Uh, and please don't call me for that, but I remember 45 is the most relevant for a humanitarian or for a um, uh, culture causes or for all the uh, services that NGOs normally provide. Um, if it's something that has to do with the health or education, then we have to probably select another category. But after we pick the category, we pick the brand, we select which entity will own this trademark, we will move and get it applied and registered. Once it's registered, you are free to run your campaign and do everything without any difficulties or without any risk of seeing anyone will come and or any third party will come and challenge that for you. Thank you so much. Okay, let's move on to patents quickly. I have a couple questions on patents. One is how realistic is it to patent your product in terms of cost? How many patent products for cost? Sorry, say that again? Yeah, I, I think basically they want to know how expensive it is to patent a product yeah. and is it worth their while going for a patent? I mean, before you move with the process of patent, definitely you need to know if what you have developed is actually an invention. So before you do that, you need to do a proper review of the elements. And that's something you should do it with your counsel and after signing a confidentiality and a privilege agreement where you would be feeling comfortable to reveal the information, the minimum information. And then if let's assume that it ticks the box and it's something that is eligible for patent protection, you will start with the drafting of patent. The drafting process is probably pretty much expensive. And then you move and file the patent for registration. The cost of filing a patent in a brief or in rough, depend on how sophisticated are the claims, and filing the patent, it should be something that should cost between 20 to 25 to 30,000 dirhams. That is an average. After you do the filing, there is something called substantive examination. If the examiners come back to you and say, we have this comments and you need to reply to this to show us what's this prior rights or, or any comments, then that's where the fees will start to accumulate. But if let's assume they come back to you and give you a granting, then you just need to move with the publications and do the granting. And this is like another phase, which you're probably going to need to pay it after one or two years from filing the patent. You just need to remember the time frame of granting a patent in all over the world. Normally, it ranges between a year to three years. So that's why getting a patent protection is something that you might need to manage your expectations, manage your merchandise, manage your plan before you move and apply for a patent as it is something okay. that is not uh, uh, always uh, being informed for the patentee before they move yeah. and file their patent. Okay. Another question is on many products, I noticed the words patent pending. What does that mean? And what protection does that give the owner? Yeah, unfortunately, Pending patents mean it's filed, it's under examination. That's exactly the, the period that I've just mentioned now. 
because there's a plenty of patents and they are being filed, examiners have a limited time to examine those patents and give their decision. So, so long as it's pending, that's mean no protection is granted yet. Once the patent is granted, assuming it ticks the box and it gets approved, you get the protection from the date of filing. Any infringements that happen after the filing of patent, in theory, you are eligible to move and file infringements for it. The way how you deal with that differs from country to country. On top of my head, in some countries like the US and the maybe EU, if there is a pending patent application and you see someone is infringing it, normally you put them on notice and you inform them about your patent rights. So once it gets registered or granted and they continue with their infringement, you will be able to claim a hefty damages and a hefty compensation. In some other countries, like for instance, the UAE and uh, in our region, you normally serve that notice, try to wait for the, uh, for the patent to be granted and then you go and claim for damages for that period of infringement. But because the system is different, common law versus civil law, maybe the amount of compensations and the criteria of building the compensation differs. For instance, when you serve a notice in the US or in other countries uh, in EU, you probably, in the US in specific, you can claim punitive damages, which is like really hefty sanctions that can reach high amount against the violators. In other countries like the UAE, you need to show the actual damage, the actual loss that you have suffered from, and then move and claim damages and compensations. But as a pending application, to answer your question, you will not be able to move and enforce it immediately unless it's get registered. And same thing apply for the trademark. The trademark does not get protected unless it gets registered. But the time frame to register a trademark is pretty much reasonable. In the UAE, you can get it registered within three to four months from filing date. So most of the brand and trademark owners, they don't face a problem of moving with enforcement. For copyright, you don't need to do anything uh, as registration is optional. You can immediately move once you become aware of the infringement to take the action and to try to claim damages. So just a quick comparison. I know the question was only about the patent, but just a quick comparison okay. about the three types of yeah. And actually, I have a question on registering a trademark. How long does it take to register a trademark? Um, three, to four, three to five months, probably I mentioned that, probably less. There is a publication yeah. period where they allow 30 days for opposition. But normally nowadays they are very expedited. So we see some marks are being registered within two months period. But okay. you should always aim for a period between two to five months, assuming no issues, no problems or no mistakes. For local trademark applicant, they get the filing, they get the decision in a few days, and they get it published. So normally in less than two months, if they file it directly, they can get the registration done by the ministry. In the past, it used Super. to take one year. Nowadays, they fix this issue and it gets registered very quickly. Super. Okay, I'm gonna jump into copyright. I promised you ladies, I would get to all your questions and I think we have about five left. So. Okay. One question is, how do you protect an idea before sharing it with investors, or even if you're part of like an accelerator, one of the, the entrepreneurship programs? Well, that's, that's a very strategic question. Always have your confidentiality, always have your NDAs, but always remember one thing. Always remember one thing. If your rights is registrable, make sure that you register it before you share it. If the necessity does not allow you that or the circumstances does not allow that, always be picky with whom you are sharing it. You can put the best contract, you can put the best agreements, you can put the best uh, 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 NDAs, you can put the, anything that can close it from everywhere. But if you have your information and your know-how shared with a wrong person or a wrong partner or a wrong potential investor, Papers will just gonna be papers. Will, you will have to go through the painful process of enforcing it. So always be selective, look at the credentialities of the opponent, do your due diligence on the person with whom you share the information, and then do your paperwork and get that NDAs and confidentiality will draft it and share the minimum you can share. And then by stages, you move to the, to the, to the final stage where you share all the information you have about your trade secrets or your invention. Okay, 
We have a question from one of our architects in the room today. She wanted to know, is just the architectural design or the entire plan layout a copyright? Uh, the architect designs, it's a special type of copyrights. Yes, it is protected as a copyright. All the uh, protection that you would assume from uh, architectural works, uh, they are eligible for a protection and you should get a proper assignment from your architect before you uh, move and apply or implement your their, 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 their designs or you want to claim ownership on it. Some of the architects, they keep the designs for themselves. They share it with their customers based on license or based on authorization. So that's something that uh, you are also eligible to do. Uh, the protection of the architecture works as a copyright, it's less than 50 years, if I'm not mistaken. I just need to look at the duration again, but it's it's less than 50 years, maybe 20 years, if I'm not mistaken, from the time of creation. Uh, but uh, certainly it's eligible for protection as a copyright. And uh, certainly as a customer, you need to make sure that when your design give you the, when your designer or when your architect give you the designs, he also give you the indemnity and all the warranties that they got it. And it's their original work rather than having it. Uh, Super, okay. Two questions, pretty much the same. So I'm going to give you both because it's it's similar. So one is a local artist. What can they do if they see their work being copied or sold by others? And then the other is if you send a proposal with a unique concept to a client or a potential client, can you prevent them from giving the concepts to cheaper suppliers? Well, this proposal, if it was sent in a proper way, it's a very strong evidence that you own this copyrights and this designs. And most importantly, it put the other party on notice that if they move and apply it and they use it without coming back to you, that they have committed an infringement of your rights and you are eligible for all the compensations that is uh, suitable to repair your damages. The problem sometimes is that some project owners or developers, they start the project and while they are in the in the in the in the process of planning or to start to execute the project they get out of nowhere some propositions and proposals from other contractors or sorry from other architects and there where issues gets a little bit messed up to know who owns or who developed those artworks or those uh, type of designs and uh, that's another task and exercise which we run normally to find out and verify who was the original source or the original author of those type of copyrightable materials. Super. Okay. Um, courts, do the courts hold registered and unregistered copyrights in the same way? And how is it proved if no registration is necessary? The law is silent about registrations and the, even the international agreement that governed the copyrights, which UA is part of it, it's called Bern Convention. It clearly says that registration is not required. So in terms of compensation, in terms of damages, in terms of all the remedies, it's all the same. The only thing that you will be able to capitalize on if you have a registered copyright is that it will make your process in the UAE much, much easier. You have a default assumption and evidence to show that you are the owner of those copyrights and you move immediately with, uh, uh, with the protection and enforcement. Uh, in other countries like US, for instance, as far as I recall, there is something called the statutory damages. You can always claim it when you put, uh, when you have your copyrights recorded there and registered there. So it's an additional layer of damages which you can claim. But having said that, in the UAE, it's going to give you the same results. It's only the process. Now, if you don't have a registration, which most of the copyright owners, they don't get registration. You just need to show a proof that you have the earliest date of creating this work. This could be if you are an individual, this should could be uh, in computer program, you can send all the materials in an email to you and that email will be recorded and that email will show that it was sent from you to yourself on that day so no one can question the date of its creation. 
or it can be something that has can be supported by witness statements, by uh, by any way of evidences where you can show that you have created it on that day. By publishing it, for instance, publishing it on the first day is also an evidence that you have created it on that day. Super. Okay, I've gone through our list, and there's a couple of ladies who have snuck in a few quick questions here which I'll cover and then we can wrap it up. So one is, is the design of a chair copyright or industrial design? The design of a chair? A chair. A chair. That you sit on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, in the UAE, you can have the design of the chair if it's distinctive to gather it even as a trademark. It's a product chair. It can apply for three of them. Now, before you get it for industrial design, it has to meet some certain criteria a novel one or something that is extremely uh, uh, and something that is extremely uh, uh, innovative. Uh, but I would say uh, copyright will be the best way to deal with it. And most importantly, if you are already manufacturing it and if you already put it on sale and it's very special design of the share, worth to look at the protection of the trademark in the UAE. It allows you, the system allows you for a shape registration Register the shape, it will give you an excellent protection and you will be able to enforce it. Always think of a trademark as the first option because this is something that is the system is familiar with, the, uh, uh, the protection of it is really well established. You can go for all the option, administrative or criminal or police when there is a direct counterfeiting or direct infringement. And when you present the certificate, you will have a prima facie uh, rights to move and enforce it against third parties. Super. And last one, if a logo is trademarked, do they need to add the TM suffix to the logo? Is that important? It is not important at all. It's optional for you. You don't have to put TM or R. R sometimes put R in circle. R means stands for registered. These are all uh, innovative way to let public know that this is a trademark. So you put them on notice if they infringe it. In the US, for instance, and UK and other countries, uh, they give you some rights for used trademark that is not registered. So the people who use marks without registration, uh, they put the TM, TM stands for marks that is being in used and not necessarily registered. But when you put R, that is mean that the mark is registered. It's absolutely your choice. You don't need to mention that. It's not gonna have any uh, effect on you as of the current system and the current practice in the courts in the UAE, as this is something that is completely optional for you. Okay, super. Munir, you've been a superstar today. I appreciate <laughs> it. I, 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 I love that it was so engaging and I like all the questions. Uh, I'm proud to be called for this one. I feel privileged to be around you all. You are all great, talented people. And I will really, I mean, Jennifer, I, it's probably the first time we've done it together, Jenny, but please feel free to let me know if I can be of your help, you, you and team help, or any of the members at any time, even on a pro bono basis, I'm more than happy to, to support and to spare some time for you because you're basically gonna drive the economy. If, if all the things keep going well with you, we're gonna have a great boost of the economy for SMEs or small business or even the big businesses that comes from your side because this is uh, the future of the country. And I'm very privileged again to be with you this morning. Thank you so much. And absolutely, the women that have been involved in the UN Women NAMA program are outstanding. So really phenomenal business uh, owners, very intentional about building and growing their businesses. So thank you so much for supporting UN Women in NAMA and all of our women entrepreneurs. And to all of you for being part today, thank you so much for giving us your time. And as always, ladies, we are always stronger together and keep working together, collaborating and supporting each other. And thank you for your time today. And we'll see you either next week for the Arabic session or in two weeks for our next workshop on getting your products stocked. Have a lovely afternoon, everyone. Bye. Bye.